Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah Seams, and I'm the director of the Joseph McKean Center for the Common Good here at Bowdoin. I want to thank uh, the folks in alumni relations for inviting us to have this conversation today. I want to let you know before we dive into things that closed captioning is available on this broadcast. So feel free to find that and turn that on. Uh, we have with us three current students, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and just tell you who they are. Uh, we're going to have a discussion about uh, the experiences they had this past summer um, with summer fellowships with either um, local or community organizations um, or work doing global work um, with organizations around the country. So um, I'm going to tell you who's with us and then we're going to give them a chance to share their experiences a bit. I'll have some questions for them and then we're happy to take questions from the audience as well. So as I mentioned, we have three students with us. The McKean Center actually has four different summer fellowship programs. Um, the students here today represent three of those programs. Uh, we have mm -hmm. Liana Harrington, who is a class of 21. Uh, she's a major in English and a minor in urban studies. She had the Denning Fellowship this past summer and worked with the Emergency Action Network here in Brunswick. Adriana Nazarko is also a member of the class of 21. She's a double major in government and legal studies and Asian studies. And she had the Bowdoin Public Service Fellowship with the Nuclear Threats Initiative based in Washington, DC. And we have Roman Parahone, the class of 22. He is a double major in government and legal studies and economics with a minor in German. Uh, and his fellowship originally was going to be with the Global Citizens Fellowship, which sends students outside of the United States. Uh, but because of COVID-19, he had to adjust his plans and he ended up working with All People's Community Center in Los Angeles. So the way this is gonna work, I'm gonna give each of them about five minutes just to give us an overview of their experience from the summer. Uh, and then uh, I'll dive into some questions. So why don't we start um, just in the order that I introduced folks. So Liana, would you mind going first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you overview of teen and then what my role was in the organization as well? Yeah, that would be okay, great. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, awesome. So Emergency Action Network, teen for short, um, is a nonprofit in Brunswick working with local asylum seeking families and also with families living around or below the poverty line. Um, so they kind of have a, a two pronged approach, so to speak. Um, the first one is that they meet um, needs expressed in the community either um, through a, a, an anonymous referral process, um, through either school department faculty, um, guidance counselors. Um, so basically um, those folks can submit requests for winter clothes, shoes. Um, we had a request for, for an adult tricycle, um, or not a tricycle, but one of the ones that have like the training wheels, um, adult bicycle with training wheels um, this summer. Um, and then teen will reach out into the community, um, ask if anyone has anything to donate um, or any funds um, to share, and then they will drop the item off or items off at the school, and then the school will distribute those items. Um, so totally anonymous um, process. Um, and then for asylum seeking families, it's a bit different. There's really not that kind of um, anonymity there. Um, so working directly with asylum um, seeking families in Brunswick, there are 19 currently, um, and uh, teams doing Ha, basically has a kind of community um, or committee approach. So there's a public health committee, um, there's a legal committee that's working on processing asylum seeking applications um, and basically just like working together in small groups to address um, needs that come up um, throughout the throughout the, the year essentially um, and in the future. Um, so, so my role was a bit um, I don't want to say all over the place, but I was definitely, I had my hand in a lot of proverbial cookie jars. Um, Teen is an amazing organization led by six fantastic women um, that are naturally very busy and also have daytime jobs as well. Um, so I and the other intern, Mary, um, were, we were kind of in charge of handling administrative work. So making sure the website was up to date, uh, making sure information was clear on how to handle referrals um, and donation drop-offs. Um, and also doing, um, actually getting the opportunity to jumpstart um, some programs as well. Um, so we started up this English language program um, to help the local sound seeking kids um, practice English with us. Um, so we were doing that socially distance um, and outside or over Zoom. Um, and then we were also working on this new bike program that's been 
kind of working under the umbrella of TEAM, but basically allowing the asylum seeking families and other folks that are in need of a transportation that's not a car, um, helping them get access to bicycles, handling donations, um, and then also kind of setting up frameworks to start doing bike safety and bike repair workshops in the future. Um, kind of other, our other large project was working on an oral history project with teens. So we interviewed all the board members and then at least 15 to 20 community members, folks working at the school, um, folks working in like the public health arena and just like seeing what teens impact has been in the community since they were founded in 2016. Um, in, and yeah, and then also just like other tasks like dropping off cases of ginger ale and like doing some legal research to help with some of the asylum cases um, and just kind of like whatever was coming our, our way. Um, so yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Adriana, could you go next? Sure, thank you. Um, I worked with the Nuclear Threat Initiative this summer. Um, we're an organization that deals with the threat of weapons of mass destruction and sort of works towards alleviate weapons of mass destructions, whether it's chemical, um, biological, or nuclear, which was the foundation of the organization. Um, NTI was founded by Senators Nunn and Luger, who are actually the driving force behind the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program in the Soviet Union. So that program helped to dismantle um, and return nuclear weapons and warheads from former Soviet states like Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. And that program is the primary reason that those countries no longer have nuclear weapons. And they signed on to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty as non-nuclear states, which was a huge accomplishment at the time. And so NTI tries to go forward with that work and strives towards the elimination of nuclear weapons throughout the world and the alleviation of um, threats from nuclear weapons or potential dirty bombs through terrorist organizations as well. Um, I work specifically with the International Fuel Cycle Strategies team, uh, which works with all elements of the nuclear fuel cycle, whether it's related to the proliferation of uh, fissile material for purposes of nuclear weapons uh, development or uh, nuclear waste. There's a lot to do with nuclear waste, <laughs> whether it's coming from our reactors, whether it's coming from um, just stockpiles and stockpiles of decades worth of uh, fuel <laughs> or used fuel that um, we just don't know what to do with. Um, there's a lot that goes into the processing of that material and we still have no proper solution. We don't have any long-term solutions for what to do with that waste. Um, so throughout the summer, I got to work with the, uh, the FC team, the Fuel Cycle Strategies team on a number of projects. Um, it was mostly research-based, although I did get to participate in a couple of um, strategies um, and I got to participate in the IPNDB, which is a conference that dealt with um, certain scenarios for like if something were to happen or proliferation were to happen, how to deal with a country that that would happen in. Um, but a couple of the projects I got to work on specifically related to nuclear waste, for example, um, were, was what Russia was doing with its nuclear waste and how that compared to the United States. Um, currently, Russia is also trying to dismantle a lot of its nuclear weapons and sort of drudge up nuclear submarines that it sunk in the Arctic Ocean that are now stuck there and slowly leaking radiation <laughs> into the surrounding waters, um, which is going to become, which has become a problem for a lot of Scandinavian countries, which they're worried about, um, but also is just a, a problem for Russia. So they're trying to bring those subs back up and also dismantle former nuclear weapons that they have um, and sort of figure out how to process that waste and store that waste in these larger facilities. Um, so one of the projects I got to work on was categorizing which facilities Russia currently has, what they're doing, what type of dismantlement processes they're using, what they're looking at for long-term storage solutions for nuclear waste, um, and how exactly the submarine problem is going to be solved. Because nobody currently knows it's still a work in progress. Um, and there is a lot of research that goes into that because you don't want to mess up the surrounding environment and then make it radioactive for um, a, an unlimited amount of time. Um, some of the other projects that I worked on, um, so my personal interests directly relate to North Korea and denuclearization in North Korea. And I was very grateful that I got to work with a team that had a lot of experience in the negotiation of nuclear agreements. Two of the members previously worked on the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. So I got to pick their brains about what that process was like which was really amazing. And I got to conduct my own personal research on the history of North Korea's nuclear program and some of the leading figures in that program, because who you negotiate with is 
important to understanding exactly the type of concessions that you might get. Um, and their background is important to understanding their technical knowledge um, and how far you can push that. Um, a couple of other projects that I got to work on um, was with another colleague. Um, we worked on what exactly safeguards looks like. Safeguards are basically the, the measures that you put in place to ensure that uh, material isn't being stolen from like nuclear reactors or nuclear facilities and then used for other purposes like developing a bomb. Um, a lot of that starts to change when COVID started to change when COVID-19 began um, because then you have workers who can no longer come into facilities and make sure that nothing is going wrong. And so we were working on developing a plan to look at how systems and safeguards um, and security might change in the future in cases of emergency um, and how the IAEA, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency, might think more comprehensively about the steps that they take to ensure that they can still accurately determine that material isn't being um, diverted for illegal uses um, despite a, a natural disaster, a catastrophe, or even a global pandemic. Thank you. Roman. Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so I spent my summer interning at All People's Community Center, which is a local nonprofit organization located in South LA. Um, and All People's is, um, it provides vital services, um, like a wide array of services to both adults and youth in South LA. So it, they provide stuff from ESL classes to employment assistance, financial literacy classes, legal services, immigration services, academic support, um, food, supplemental food programs, daycare, and much more, all entirely free to the community. Um, so they really are a comprehensive organization that I got to work with um, that are sort of trying to address a bunch of different issues that are um, facing the residents of South LA. Um, and their mission is mostly focused on um, community, community development and promoting self-determination and empowering um, indi individuals and families in South LA. Um, so I got started working with them in June and over the course of my summer, my primary role was supporting the center's response to the impacts of COVID-19, um, to the, the sort of the economic and um, the economic impacts of COVID-19 on um, the local community. Um, so I worked closely with various program directors, um, coordinators, case managers, and administrators um, to sort of respond to the new overwhelming demand for different service, um, services. Um, um, so yeah, so some things that I worked on was um, some, some of my projects included um, expanding the capacity for the center's supplemental food program, um, enrolling new clients in their homeless prevention program, um, processing clients for emer emergency and financial emergency financial and rental assistance, um, and assessing the needs of the of families and vulnerable populations in the community. Um, and some of my tasks included um, organizing the food re sort of reorganizing the food distribution um, since that had to be in person um, and just organizing to ensure the, the safety of both the clients and the staff. Um, I worked a lot with sort of processing data for the different for the different programs and also um, serving as a translator, processing applications. Um, I conducted a lot of phone interviews with community members, sort of trying to assess their needs and see what, what exactly the, the center could focus on in order to sort of meet um, their, their needs. Um, and also um, referring clients to the different resources that are available in the community. So not just um, this, the ones that were available at All Peoples, but also sort of connecting them with also different nonprofits or resources um, through the city. Um, yeah, and overall, I gained a really um, in-depth look at sort of the complexities of running a local urban nonprofit, um, especially in a time of crisis, um, and also a firsthand understanding of the, the different issues that are affecting the, um, the community there. Thank you. Uh, that's actually a great transition into the, the next question. And I'm, I'm gonna stay with you, Roman, if you don't mind. Um, wondering how the pandemic uh, affected your summer. So 
I think there's a lot of different levels to that. Um, certainly how did it affect your, your own personal plans uh, as well as how did it affect the organization or the community that you were working with? Roman? Yeah, so uh, like you mentioned, I am the, the Global Citizens Fellow on this panel. Um, so my original plan, plan for the summer looked pretty different for, than what it ended up being. So um, my, I, had, I had planned to go to Argentina um, and work with a local, with a community organization in um, Buenos Aires. Um, I was gonna work, I was gonna work with community outreach and teach English there. Um, however, I couldn't do that because of the pandemic and I had to sort of rework things. Um, yeah, so I had to, to sort of search for a new community host somewhere local um, near me. So I ended up a lot closer to home. Um, so yeah, I got, con so I reached out to all people's community center and I got started um, working with them. Um, and then what were the other parts of the question? Sorry. So uh, that was just, you've already said a little bit about this, but how the pandemic affected the organization you worked with or the community that you were working with. Right. Um, so yeah, the, the pandemic really, really hit the community that I was working with hard. Um, South LA is, um, is a, a predominantly low income, predominantly community of color. And I, I'm sure as a lot of you have heard that um, the pandemic, the effects of the pandemic um, disproportionately affect those communities. And that was definitely something um, that I saw over the summer. Um, it's just, um, just com like uh, just people's lives were turned upside down. There was a lot of unemployment and just a lot of instability in the community. Um, and of course, um, all peoples was sort of ready to sort of adapt themselves and sort of turn all the programs around to sort of respond to this need um, of their community members. So yeah, most of the programming over the summer was focused on that, was re responding to the pandemic. Um, a lot of the other services that they provide were sort of um, put on the back burner over the course of the summer. Um, like their youth programs were pretty much closed for the summer. Um, they also had like summer, pro summer programs for kids. They had to close those down and they were just mostly focused on sort of responding to the, to the pandemic. Um, and I think another part was if I had any pandemic specific jobs and most of my jobs were pandemic specific, um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Adriana or Liana, either one of you want to answer this next? I can go, if that's okay. Zoom is always a weird like negotiation of who's going to unmute first. Um, yeah, so in, in terms of, of COVID, in terms of, of, what, of what I was expecting for like my summer plans, um, I had been originally planning to be in Brunswick, um, working in person and living in, in Bowdoin housing. Um, and I actually ended up, um, luckily enough, uh, living in Brunswick. Um, I, I spent the first half of June working from home. Um, and then I was able to transition um, to live in Brunswick with a couple of other Bowdoin folks um, that were working with other nonprofits in the area. Um, so as for how the pandemic affected my responsibilities, um, just in terms of the populations we're working with, um, Obviously, I don't get to see the folks that we're working with um, for the referral process at the schools, um, but for the asylum seeking folks, um, again, as, as Roman mentioned, I was working with um, a population that was mainly low income people of color um, and also folks that have a current somewhat precarious um, immigration status. Um, so uh, yeah, issues of food insecurity, financial struggles, public health risks in general, um, also just worries about like immigration, work permits. Um, there've been recent um, legislations that have been passed that made it a lot more difficult for folks seeking asylum to apply for work permits. Um, so um, the ways that teen um, kind of adjusted to that was first just by distributing PPE, um, getting volunteers to actually drive food to families instead of them um, going to uh, Midkiss Fire Prevention Program, the, the food um, bank downtown. Um, 
Also, we have a volunteer network of around 140 drivers that will basically just like step up when someone needs to drive, um, needs to ride to like a medical appointment or something like that. Um, but because a lot of those volunteers are on the kind of like older side of the spectrum, um, we've been reworking who um, who is available to drive, and it's mostly just been board members and then also myself because um, I do have um, a car as well, luckily. Um, and then kind of I, maybe the main thing that I was involved with in terms of the COVID response was um, Tina's done these weekly community meetings um, just with all of the families, whoever would like to show up um, with uh, Siono, who's Brunswick's cultural broker. Um, so every Friday they would usually have them in person, but since um, since pandemic hit, it's been online over Zoom. Um, and they have been kind of organizing for a volunteer, um, not a volunteer, like a community member a week um, to come in and just chat with the families, answer questions, concerns. Um, the superintendent came in to talk about their questions um, regarding like what their kids' school years were gonna look like. Um, a nurse came in to talk about COVID concerns and how to keep them and their family safe. Um, and just like checking in, we would do this exercise called like checking your battery, like like how's your battery doing? Like where's your energy level at? Um, and just like making sure we were keeping that communication open. Um, and, and yeah, for the most part, I would say that the only thing that really changed what I was expecting to be in charge of um, or like involved with is just like how much um, contact I was able to have um, with the families and folks that we're working with. Um, but by, by July and August, we kind of figured out a safe social distance way to do that. Thanks. Adriana? Thank you. Um, I spoke a little bit briefly about the Safeguards Project that one of my colleagues and I did that was relating specifically to um, COVID-19 protocol or protocol in the case of a natural disaster. Um, but NTI, NTI is divided into a number of teams. So I, I originally was supposed to be with NTI as a result of the BPS, the Vote and Public Service Initiative. Um, which would have placed me in DC. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, I could no longer be in DC. Um, the entire organization went fully remote. Um, so I stayed I stayed in Maine um, and I was able to do work from Maine. Um, sorry, there's a there's a tractor coming through. <laughs> um, I I think NTI usually has a very robust internship program. Um, and it allows its interns to do a lot of individual work and also work with the scholars and the public, the former public servants that work in the organization. Um, and so you get to see each other. One of the things that they um, told me based off of previous internship experiences was that you would get to interact a lot in person and just stop each other in the hallway and chat about certain subjects and be able to meet people outside of your program. Um, since I was in the fuel cycle program, there's also global nuclear policy. There's um, more of a cybersecurity program. There's a bio program that works with infectious diseases, but their summer got entirely transformed to working with COVID-19. Um, so they actually helped put together um, daily email updates of news relating and pertaining to COVID-19, which um, then got sent out to the entire organization. But I think a lot of the work that I did was still similar to the work that I would have done in person, but transformed online. Um, and I think I definitely have my supervisors to thank for that um, because they were very cognizant of the fact that this wasn't the internship experience necessarily that I signed up for, but they still worked very hard to ensure that I got the same opportunities that an intern would have gotten in person, um, which included sort of like an open Zoom door policy <laughs> where I could just email them or ask them to chat about something and they'd be very willing to sign up and, and sit down and chat with me about any type of subject that I um, found interesting at the time. Um, and I think they did an amazing job of balancing um, long-term projects and short-term projects um, and also uh, integrating me into the team in general. Um, we had weekly meetings and then I also had weekly check-ins with a number of people on the team. So I still got some face-to-face -face action that would have been otherwise um, impossible, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question, and you've all alluded to some pieces of this, but I'm wondering if there's um, one specific piece of learning that either was surprising for you from your summer or something that has felt most significant, uh, and anyone can start. Oh, 
or I can call on you if that's easier. <laughs> I, I can hop on. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Um, um, so I think my part of my initial interest in, in working with teen came from um, just hearing about my, oh, so for context, my mom is a first generation American immigrant um, from the Philippines. Um, so like just hearing stories about the kind of really taxing process she went to eventually um, receive her US citizenship. Um, and, and through my time with teen, not only did I really just kind of get a real um, in-depth understanding of, understanding of what it means to be um, a kidney member just like working to run a nonprofit, but then also have like all of these responsibilities on your plate. Um, I learned a lot just about like the legal process in regard to immigration. Um, uh, I was able to sit on a few meetings with our legal committee um, and just learning about um, the ways that asylum applications work, um, what the difference between um, the kind of two different forms of applications um, there are for all of our folks that we're working with, they're working with defensive ap um, asylum applications. So basically working against a, an order for their removal from the United States, um, which very much changes um, what, what that process looks like and, and what goes into it. Um, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, part of my work was just doing um, legal research and learning what databases you need to be using um, to like get the information and evidence you need to be making these cases. Um, and, and now kind of transferring that into what I'm doing this year uh, with my classes. Um, I am in a class, um, an English creative writing class um, on, it's called Personal Essays Political, um, and basically using um, short or long form um, creative nonfiction as a way to somehow garner um, or, or just like, yeah, to garner social change or to advocate for social change. Um, so I've been working on, on the longer piece um, this semester um, on, on immigration in the United States, uh, which is a super <laughs> vague uh, generalization, but that is, um, I've been weaving in my personal experiences with my mother um, and then also just like what I was able to learn um, about what it means and what it takes to, to be a US citizen um, in, into that piece, which has been um, really incredible. Um, and then, and then just in terms of like, I guess I can also talk a bit about my continued involvement with teen. Um, I, I'm not in a full-time role as I was in the summer, um, but I am still in touch with um, some of the folks that I was able to, to meet over the summer. Um, I still WhatsApp and occasionally um, hang out socially distanced with um, some of the high school folks. Um, and, and I'm hoping to be able to take on um, a bit of a, a, a role with a bit of a more responsibility next semester um, at the end of my senior year and also when I'm taking three classes. Um, so, so yeah. Thanks. Uh, so Adriana, do you want to go next and then Roman? Yes, I will jump on in. Um, I think one of the things that I'm most appreciative of from NTI, and this is entirely fully credit to the team that I worked with, um, was the amazing sense of community that they fostered. Um, and they really, they pulled no punches when it came to work. If I was like, oh, can I work on a project? Do you have anything for me? They were like, yes, take this subject and roll with it and we'll see what you can come out of, which was an amazing experience because I had come in with limited knowledge about the nuclear process. I had worked previously with North Korea and like a little bit of um, a little bit of nuclear policy in Russia, um, but didn't really get the full breadth or experience um, or have an understanding of really what nuclear policy was. Uh, and I came in into, into NTI and I came out of NTI with a, a much better understanding of exactly what some of the major issues that um, the nuclear policy world um, faces today are um, and how I can better, and, and more of the different types of career paths that I could take potentially. Um, there's, there's a lot to be grateful for with NTI. I, many of the people that I worked with were just amazing scholars and amazing individuals, amazing public servants. Um, and it was a pleasure to get to know them and to continue to stay in touch. Um, but they, they offered very extensive career development. Um, they offered to, they always offered to put me in touch with other individuals that they know who might be interested in the same types of things that I am, um, which is pretty great. And um, 
throughout the summer, I also had opportunities to visit different organizations and go to different webinars, um, including the INMM conference, which was a conference on nuclear materials management. Uh, and as a portion of that conference, um, NTI actually funded uh, a class that I took online during that time at Texas A&M, um, which gave me a certification in policy and the technical fundamental, uh, the technical fundamentals and nuclear safeguards, um, which was really cool. I had to do a little bit of math in that class, but <laughs> it was totally worth it. Um, and yeah, I think I, I'm very, very grateful to have gotten the chance to work with them and get to know some of the work that they do. Um, so I, I can only aspire to one day circle back to NTI once I'm a higher level official, I guess. Fingers crossed. Roman? Yeah, so um, overall um, lessons from the summer, um, definitely um, an experience um, um, in learning adaptability and, and resilience. Um, both in my own personal experience and both also what I what I saw from community members and also my organization. Um, yeah, so just learning a lot from um, other people's experiences and um, yeah, so a lot of my work was sort of conducting phone interviews with community members and just taking a lot from that and sort of coming to understand um, what it looks, what sort of these Broader, broader issues look like on a personal level or what it's like um, for the individual person. Um, yeah, and then also just um, what it looks like for um, a, local, a local nonprofit to sort of deal with these broader issues of social inequality at a community level, um, working with people day to day. Um, yeah, and what, and what they're able to accomplish. Um, Surprisingly, I learned a lot about so social work. I learned I worked a lot with case managers and stuff, which was total, a totally new world for me. Like I didn't even I didn't even know what case managing was when I first um, began. So I also got to learn a lot about that. Thank you. Uh, and my last question before we take questions from the audience, and um, on that note, I'm going to encourage audience members to go ahead and start entering questions into the Q&A function. Uh, so we'll see those when, when this next question is done. Um, so Liana talked a little bit about her continued connection with TEAM. Uh, and so I'm wondering for our other two panelists, um, if you've stayed connected with the organization um, or if not direct connections, like if you're seeing any long-term um, impact that connects with um, this fall semester for you and your academics or other activities that you're involved with. Either of you wanna go first? Adriana. Yeah, I um so I have a little bit of both. Um, through some of the work that I did at NTI, um, I was able to learn more about the cooperative threat reduction program and sort of what that would look like in North Korea. Um, NTI regularly publishes reports on um the potential to influence new policy. And so because of that and because of the the sort of ex broad expansion that I got throughout my summer, um I'm working on an honors project that's influenced by the work that I did at NTI um, on cooperative threat reduction and what that looked like in the former Soviet Union and potential projects that could be looked at in implementation in North Korea if a nuclear or a denuclearization deal were to be signed with the US and North Korea. Um, in terms of keeping in touch, uh, I, I have been keeping in touch with a couple of members of the team. Um, they, uh, they're throwing a holiday party actually this, this, this December and they invited all the previous interns through the past year. Um, so we'll be partying it up December 2nd. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's great. I, I hope that I can continue to keep in touch with them in the future um, because uh, in addition to being just amazing people, they're also amazing mentors uh, and just amazing conversation makers too. Thanks. Roman, do you have anything you want to add on this one? Yeah, um, I sort of try to keep up with what's going on with All People's Community Center. I read their newsletter, um, um, and as I was leaving, they um, they invite they encourage me to return in the future. Um, hope, so hopefully, I'll be able to go back and volunteer. I I hope to, um, um, but I'm not currently right now. Um, so that's for connection with the organization and for my academic experience or my other experiences, 
Um, so my work with All People's Community Center um, has inspired me to sort of um, work more with like immigration issues and more with that. So this semester I'm working with another organization that's dedicated to immigrant rights. Um, so, and a lot of sort of my experiences from, from my summer have gone into what um, have been applicable in this new role at this other organization. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, and Liana, I, you're welcome to answer this if there was anything you didn't mention before. Uh, and the question that we've gotten so far that was submitted relates to this. So if there's anything, it's just in a, from a different angle. So if there's anything that uh, you want to add to this, but the question is how have these summer experiences uh, been, been brought into and or enhanced your classroom learning? Oh, do you want me to take that or or sure if you have if you want to add to this that's great and then we can go to if anyone else wants to add. Yeah, I would love to think about it for for a second, but I definitely will have stuff to, to add as well. Anyone else want to speak to this any connections you've seen with your current classes this semester Adriana. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in real quickly. Um, one of the things that NTI um, helps me with was sort of expanding my critical thinking. Um, a lot of the issues relating to nuclear security and nuclear nonproliferation are multifaceted. You have to look at things from the subject country's approach and also from potentially the United States approach and other countries' approaches um, to their nuclear status or something that relates to their yearning for nuclear weapons or developing technology. So I definitely think having both the technical knowledge of understanding nuclear policy and then also the the more abstract ability to more critically think um, about these subjects and consider different solutions or more creative solutions to potential negotiations or even understanding um, how history is framed as well. Thanks. Roman or Liana? I have, I have something to add now, if, if that's okay. Yeah, um, yeah um, I mentioned a bit in my introduction that I was able to um, kind of do this oral history project over the summer, um, interviewing board members. And then I think we, we got to, I want to say around like 22, um, local folks in Brunswick, um, that have worked with Tina in the past, um, either in like referral role, um, or, or in like a more, like I interviewed a couple of folks that are on the public health committee, um, working to organize, um, doctor's appointments and, and medical care for these asylum seeking um, friends that we have. Um, and I, this is not something that I had really, a, a project that I'd been expecting to take on um, when I was coming into team. Um, but, but now just like having that experience with community outreach, with, with interviewing, with like investigative work in some way, shape or form and like looking for a way to document um, the impact that teen has had um, was amazing and is definitely something that I've been able to kind of carry into what I'm doing um, this semester with another course. I'm taking his, um, a history course on basically the history of New York City. Um, and for my final project, I'm gonna be doing a mini world history um, on, on bricklayers, unions um, and bricklayers, uh, masonry workers, high rise construction workers um, from New York in like 1970s, 80s, because um, I have a personal connection to that through my family on my dad's side. Um, and that's something that I'm currently working on and very excited to do. Um, and I think that at first the like cold call email was something that was very um, nerve wracking to me, uh, but now I have gotten much more um, into a rhythm with it. And it's something that I'm very excited um, to continue. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. Uh, and one more shout out to our audience members. If you want to submit any questions, feel free. Um, and I'm going to see if Roman has anything he wants to add to this one. And you all can per be percolating on my last question, which is, um, and, and this has been also alluded to in terms of your, some of you mentioned future beyond Bowdoin interests and wondering if your summer has impacted your thoughts beyond Bowdoin in any way as well. But um, Roman, do you have anything you want to add to that last question? Yeah, so um, I feel like um, a few of my courses this semester have helped me sort of build an understanding of sort of um, what of my experience over the summer. So this summer, I'm um, sorry, this semester I'm taking a course um, specifically on um, the experience of Latinx communities in the United States. Um, so that talks about a lot about like immig immigration and sort of 
getting the and sort of understanding the history and sort of the it's a socio sociology course or sort of understanding the the structure that sort of has um influences these communities um like the communities that i worked with over the summer um so that's that was that that course has been good for putting a lot of my summer experience in context um and then also i'm taking a course on um the on it's a government course on latin america and this has also helped me get an understanding for like the the sort of things that lead to immigration and sort of bring um bring these communities into the u.s so All right, thanks. And just as I was at, telling you what the last question was going to be, an audience member asked the same question. So, uh, so I'll use their wording on this. Uh, so, how do you think your summer fellowship experience will shape your plans post graduation? Anyone have any thoughts? And no pressure that it has to have, <laughs> but if you have any any thoughts on how it might have impacted your post voting plans, we'd love to hear it. Um, anyone want to go first, or I can call. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 Or, or did someone else want to speak? Or... No, you go ahead. Cool. Um, um, yeah, I think, I think if anything, just coming out of the summer, I can't, I mean, I'm, I'm an English major. I love, I love words, but I came out with a very different appreciation for language. Um, uh, funnily enough, I, I speak Spanish and funnily enough, I was actually able to serve as a translator for some of our families. Um, most of them are coming from uh, Angola and the Congo. Um, but because of the way they entered the US, they came up through South and Latin America and entered through Mexico, their point of entry in Mexico. Um, so some of them spoke better, better Spanish than they did English. Um, so I was able to be there as a kind of like secondary translator uh, when CNR Cultural Breaker, Broker was not uh, to translate neither Lingala or French um, to English um, for other teen folks. Um, and so through that, through kind of developing this English language practice conversation program, um, I definitely would love to be um, in some form or capacity um, working with language, teaching English, et cetera. Um, and, and I'm currently in the process of applying for, uh, for a Fulbright to Columbia um, as an English teaching assistant. Um, and I'm hoping to use some of the skills um, I picked up over the summer um, in that position, if it if it does work out. If not, I would love to be teaching in some way, shape, or form um, after, after Bowdoin. Thanks. Roman or Adriana? I'll jump on in. <laughs> um, I think in NTI sort of helped me understand the actual threat and the human cost that comes as a result of weapons of mass destruction or nuclear weapons. Um, I previously I had already understood sort of the impact of a nuclear disaster just because my family is from Ukraine and we were from Western Ukraine and Chernobyl is around 300 miles away, but it was still something that impacted my family members. Um, and it was a conversation that we would often have as I was growing up, but really sitting down and understanding the the true near-term like existential risk that nuclear weapons pose. Um, within 30 minutes, if, if something were deployed accidentally, everything that any one of us knows could be entirely gone. And that's a scary thought to think about. Um, but I'm glad to know that there are people like those at NTI who are working towards eliminating that risk and ensuring that the world becomes a safer place through, the, through both nonproliferation and um, by attempting to dismantle current nuclear weapons infrastructure uh, and ensuring the safe implementation of nuclear energy. So I, I, I was previously passionate about this before, um, but just the, the ability that I was able to broaden my skills and broaden my knowledge through NTI has definitely like galvanized, like it's lit a little fire inside of me um, to try to work towards alleviating these issues in the future because it's, it's a problem that's going to persist throughout our generation. And if it's something that I can work towards hopefully in the future, whether through service as a, as a public servant, um, whether through working through the State Department, whether working as a scholar um, at any given think tank or institution, um, this is definitely something that I want to work with in the future. And I, in turn, become really passionate about. Um, and it's sort of similar to Liana, um, I'm applying for a fellowship in nuclear policy um, for this next semester or for this next year. Um, and if that doesn't end up working out, I'm still going to be pursuing issues directly related to nuclear policy um, and hopefully 
continue to be able to interact with all the wonderful folks at NTI as well. Thanks. Roman. Yeah, so I think in a, in a similar way to Adriana, um, this experience has sort of galvanized and affirmed a, an interest that I had before. So definitely has affirmed my interest in sort of in public service or pursuing a career in public policy um, to sort of, yeah, sort of address the, the different issues that are impacting low-income communities of color. And um, yeah, and yeah, so sort of before affirmed that, and also my experience is sort of galvanized and sort of really directed me into wanting to pursue this specific um, thing. And I am not graduating yet, but um, so I don't know about specific graduation plans, um, but yeah, we'll see. Great. Thank you all so much uh, for being a part of this conversation. Uh, this is fantastic. And I think these students represent um, really well the types of experiences that, that students have through these fellowships every year. We're really lucky um, to be able to offer these opportunities to students. Um, and we're incredibly lucky to be able to work with amazing students like these three. So uh, thank you all for doing this. Um, thanks to our audience for joining us. And uh, you will have noted that we uh, we're recording this. And so this is going to be available through alumni relations. Uh, if you want to view it again, or if you want to tell um, other alumni about this so they can take a view of it. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day.